Hello to the internet people who decide to uh, listen slash watch. Uh, this will be a still image, so watch is maybe a bit of a, a stretch, but whoever decides to listen to this, uh, I suppose, kind of... Oh, it's like a podcast, I guess. Uh, for anyone who has uh, watched my basically last video in which I said that, you know, things are getting a bit busy, so I've decided to change up the way that I do videos for a while because I think that it would be better for me to basically just focus on uh, random academic stuff for a bit. Um, now, this, in case you didn't watch that, will be the first episode of basically a continuous series in which I discuss academic stuff uh, of, of all sorts of, of descriptions, pretty much. Uh, essentially, this will be the stuff that I am uh, doing research uh, for, for my master's, and I thought, you know, the things that are thematically relevant and whatever, it could be interesting to like chat about them and what, what they're actually about. So this will be basically an unedited, uh, unscripted thing in which we just talk about some of these uh, books, theories, etc. So in this particular case, we're going to be looking at three different uh, books slash three different there is a dog barking outside. Uh, she likes waiting until I start recording something before making her barks. Uh, she's great. Anyway, that was Pippin. Uh, she was actually in my second last video, uh, briefly. Anyway, let's move on. So, I've decided for this first one, uh, there are three books that I read that are kind of um, similar in a sense in what they tackle. So we're going to be looking at Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, and then essentially a mother-daughter duo. Uh, they, their books are not really related to each other, um, except for thematic uh, relevance and also some um, title differences. So Frances Moore Lapp, or Lappe, or Lapp, I don't know how to pronounce her name, I'm sorry. Uh, her book, Died for a Small Planet, and then also her daughter, Anna Lap, Lap, Lapper, whatever, Died for a Hot Planet, which is not really connected to Died for a Small Planet, but um, has some thematic ties to it. So, these three books are basically about environmentalism in some other sense. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about them together, because they all sort of tie in together. And also my stuff that I... Um, researching is not really focused on um, environmentalism in any kind of, in any real capacity in that sense. So I wouldn't say that it's, you know, um, really relevant in, in that sense to what I'm, I'm doing. But there are some relevancies, but I'm not going to actually talk about what I am studying specifically, but rather just in the series we'll be looking at the various things that I am studying, but not uh, what the actual general overview of it is. So, we'll start off with Silent Spring by, by Rachel Carson. Now, Rachel Carson wrote this book, and sadly, she actually passed away shortly after it was written. Um, she was, you know, one of... Uh, her entire life was pretty much dedicated to more environmental causes, especially in marine life. Um, but... In 1962, she wrote and published, or maybe she wrote it before. Anyway, she published Silent Spring. Now, Silent Spring is an extremely influential book. Um, and this is how I think you can tell that something is extremely influential. Uh, that I didn't actually get much from it. Because everything in it is stuff I already know. And I think that that is probably the mark of an extremely influential book. Because... All of this stuff, I pretty much knew from, like, primary school biology. Um, that is how how big it really it, it was. Because she, with Silent Spring, came forward and stated something radical. Now, there had been climate scientists and stuff who were working on this at the time. I don't really know if they would have been called climate scientists, but, you know, uh, ecologists, who were looking at... The, 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 the damage that was being caused by the chemicals that we use in uh, all sorts of things, especially in our food production. 
And so she was looking at that. And she essentially uh, combined it all together into this book. That's very, very readable. I would recommend reading it. It's actually great. Uh, pretty much I would say all three of these books are very, very um, worth the read. They're not particularly academic. They're not like really difficult to read. They're written in quite simple prose. Prose that makes it easy to understand. Um, and there's something really, really funny about the second one. Uh, the died for a small planet. But we'll get to that. But essentially... This first book, Silent Spring, she talks about how we developed, you know, these wonderful little things for controlling pests. So we made pesticide and we made herbicide. So things that we could kill specific animals and kill specific plants that we didn't want to have around. Things that we perceived in some or other sense as pests. Now, she didn't really get to see the, the success that, that this book would have, but it is really interesting because essentially what she talks about is how these things, herbicides, pesticides, how much they have actually sunk into our planet. So she has various sections where it's talking about, okay, how do all of these chemicals that we're pumping into the world, how do they uh, sink into our water systems? So then like, essentially we're drinking it, the animals are drinking it, the plants are feeding on it. Not great. It's getting into the soil. So it's actually killing the various... Because soil is a very, very complex thing, actually. This is why you get land that becomes completely arid. is because we farm it to the point that where it becomes just, like, completely screwed. You know, um, we farm it where all of the nutrients leaves. And that's because of the way that we farm. Often with things like single crop farming, where we, we do intensive farming on large tracts of land and we destroy the soil but now these these various things are actually also being killed by this because remember in the ecosystem everything is actually interconnected we have this idea that that everything is separate from everything else you know humans are distinct from nature but that is not true everything we do affects nature it affects the world uh, and then nature thereby affects us because of course we have to go to nature to get the things we need to survive food has to be made using nature like that's how it works so right we're pouring it into our soil we're also pouring it into our plant life and it's things like how we're killing weeds and killing animal life and actually in the third book, we'll talk a little bit about some solutions, like basically green solutions to dealing with the problems that people have used herbicides, pesticides for. So um, we are basically just introducing huge amounts of these toxins everywhere. All right. And for instance, she was one of the ones who was raising alarm bells about DDT, which we now know, for those who don't know what DDT is, DDT is basically a chemical that was created and it is really, really good at killing mosquitoes. The problem is, when you're killing these mosquitoes, and they, these, this stuff was dumped, like, everywhere. They were like, oh, we can actually, like, save people from malaria. And they just started dumping DDT. And DDT kills the mosquitoes, but then there are things that will, for instance, eat the mosquitoes. And then they could die or get sick. And we're also pumping this stuff into things like water. And... If there's one thing that, that you should understand about water is that um, <clears throat> we, we have to um, drink it. So, yeah, yeah, that's it's not great, you know, to, to do that. So we have that. And then what happens is things like birds get affected by it. Our rivers and our, our fish become completely uh, infected in these things because, remember, birds and fish and stuff, they eat these kind of things that they, they for instance do eat like mosquitoes and everything that are then having all the stuff uh happen to them and what then happens because of course humans are inherently anthropocentric by nature humans think that the human is the most important thing right not nature not animal life not plant life humans are the most important thing so she did have to come together in chapter 12 which is called the human price and saying listen the stuff is building up inside our bodies. The stuff which... Now, it, it should be obvious, but um, poison is not good for you. So you might say, oh, well, it's fine. We're going to pour poison over our plants and stuff. It won't hurt humans. 
yes, you will still get the poison in you, in, in usually trace amounts. But now, if, if you just have uh, trace amounts for a week of your life, nothing will ever happen to you. It's fine. But these are buildups. And this, for instance, has led to the increase in carcinogenic properties. So cancer has increased because of these things. Um, she discussed, remember, this is 1962, so I'm assuming there's been more data since then, but as I said, this isn't my area, uh, so I'm not going particularly in-depth into it. But, you know, <laughs> cancer is bad, and this stuff was causing more cancer, especially more leukemia, and who knows what's happened now, because this was published in 1962. 60 years ago! So, 60 years ago at time of recording. So, imagine how much more has happened since then. So, you know, not great. Now, of course, one of the other problems, this is like a big thing. This is also, for instance, what happens with um, uh, with, with various uh, viruses, bacteria, those kind of things, uh, when they are introduced to antibiotics. So, what happens? Because you see... Evolution is real, okay? Evolution is a real thing. Now, what happens when you're pumping all these chemicals, all these chemicals into the atmosphere, into the water systems, all that kind of stuff? The thing that you're doing is you're killing off the weak. The ones that are, are more resistant to the stuff, they then go on to breed. They become dominant. So then each successive generation, right, becomes more capable of surviving these chemicals. So we have to pump more chemicals and create more dangerous ones. So, you know, it's not great. She also does literally state here in chapter 16 that, that Darwin, if he was alive today, he would have been fascinated by insect life. To be like, look at this. It's actually evolving because of our, um, the things that we are doing, our actions are influencing the lives of insects. They are becoming... Uh, like dominant, because they have to respond to these things. They have to become stronger and more capable of surviving. So, basically, this book was just saying, yeah, this is it's you know, this is what's what's happening. This is the danger. And um, here's like a, a quote. Now it's from chapter two, page thirty-two. Future historians may well be amazed by our distorted sense of proportion. How could intelligent beings seek to control a few unwanted species by a method that contaminated the entire environment and brought the threat of disease and death even to their own kind? Why do we do this? To control a few, a few creatures, uh, we will poison the whole world. So, you know, we're really bright creatures. We're really, really... Highly intelligent animals, obviously. So, yeah. Anyway, that's Silent Spring. Let's move on to Died for a Hot Planet. Uh, sorry, why, why is this one next in my thing? That's wrong. Died for a Small Planet. Apologies. Okay, now this was originally published in 1971. So, nine years after Silent Spring. Uh, also, by that point, uh, Rachel Carson had died. She died, I believe, two years after this publication. So, she never got to see us now. Uh, Frances Moore Lap, Lape, Lap, Lape, I don't know. She's still alive. So, uh, at least the last time I checked, she's still alive. Uh, and her daughter's also still alive. At time of recording, obviously, if someone were to watch us in a hundred years, I assume she's dead. But, I mean, that's a while off. So, Diet for a Small Planet. Basically, this one is very, very different. Okay, and now there's a, a fun thing at the end of this. So, yes, this is all going to be depressing, but, but it, there's, a, there's some fun at the end. Okay. So, this one is all about, essentially, meat production. That's, that's really the gist of this. Okay. Meat production is immensely, immensely evasive. Uh, evasive is immensely... Um, no, I can't think of a word. Uh, wasteful, I suppose. Basically, to produce meat, we have to produce so much grain that we could feed everyone with it instead. Um, which, you know, not great. So this one, this book, argues one simple thing, right? Now, first of all, it is very anti-meat industry, but... 
it mostly focuses on one little thing. The myth of scarcity. So scare, that, that myth, the myth of scarcity is the idea that there isn't enough food for us to feed everyone. That's why, you know, some people starve. Some people go hungry. Now, once upon a time, that was true, but we've actually solved this problem. We have enough food to feed everyone on earth. Everyone. And she specifically focuses on meat production in this to show how wasteful meat production is. All right. Now, I'm going to read a quote here. Okay. Now, she is talking specifically about the United States, but of course, most of these people do because, yeah, anyway. So, she says here, For every 16 pounds of grain and soy fed to beef cattle in the United States, we only get one pound back in meat on our plates. The other 15 pounds are inaccessible to us, either used by the animal to produce energy or to make some part of its own body that we do not eat, like hair or bones, uh, or excreted. So, basically, very, very simply, 16 pounds of food we give to an animal so that we can get one pound of food back. Now, if you were to cut out the middleman here, we would get an extra 16 pounds of food. We just don't get that one pound of meat. Now, this is not taking an ethical standpoint against meat. That is probably the, the, the best standpoint in many ways to say, listen, meat consumption is actually unethical. You are uh, eating a sentient life. You are killing for the purpose of essentially your enjoyment. This is going in a very, very different perspective. It's saying, yes, listen, we've all heard the ethical things, right? Everyone does actually know that it's unethical to eat meat. They just don't think about it. This is saying, listen, it's not just the ethics of it. It's bad business. They are making less food than they could. They could make more food by just not having cattle. This isn't even talking about things like deforestation or anything. This is just the fact that to make an animal, you have to use so much food to get out so little food. It doesn't matter in this particular case if you think meat is unethical or not. Meat is wasteful. That is the big thing here. All right, very, very big thing. I did actually also write here in my notes that Chapter 3 goes really, really well with the sexual politics of meat. I will probably at some point make a, a little video thing about discussing the sexual politics of meat. But if you are interested in this kind of thing, because meat is a very, very interesting thing. is uh, It's a book called The Sexual Politics of Meat by Carol J. Adams. Uh, it's a fantastic book and I would definitely recommend people read it. Uh, but the, it's, it has a very, very different focus. But it's part of this. So chapter 3 is called The Meat Mystique. Meat forms a part of culture. So even though we don't need to eat meat, there, there is nothing biologically necess uh, nece uh, necessary for humans to consume meat. The people who claim otherwise are wrong. There, there's no other way to say it. They're wrong. We can survive on plant uh, proteins alone. You don't actually... Like the, the idea that Oh, no, it's natural. Lots of things are natural. Arsenic is natural. We don't eat it. So it might be natural to eat meat in that sense. But since when have we been natural? It's been quite a while since we've been natural. So meat becomes a, a thing of, of uh, status. When, you're, when you have more money, you consume more meat. And this is actually shown with some countries. When countries become richer, the amount of meat consumption increases. So that isn't great. And meat essentially yeah, just, just means some things. So she um, asks a couple of like questions here. It's in a chapter called Asking the Right Questions. She says that scarcity, so obviously the question is, you know, is, is scarcity the sole source of hunger? Scarcity is not the sole source of, of, of hunger. And increasing our production of, of animals and what have you won't actually fix hunger because they're not incentivized to fix hunger. Businesses are not incentivized to, to feed people. That isn't the point of food production. It's not to feed people. It's to make a profit. 
Okay, that is the actual point, the purpose of food production, not just meat production. All food is there to make a profit in our modern world. So anyway, she also says we need to redefine. Now, these were questions, but I wrote them as statements because, yeah, anyway, we need to actually redefine ideas of things like development and freedom. The idea of freedom to eat certain things and the idea of what development means. Okay. And number three, democracy needs to go beyond the government. We need to actually have democracy. So remember, democracy is the, the right to choose, which we don't actually have in our work life. If you work for a boss, that is not democracy. You might have democracy in your politics, but if you have a boss, it means that your boss who, so if, if your boss can hire, fire, he makes all the decisions. He or she makes all the decisions. That is an autocracy. They are an authoritarian power because they have the power to do what they want in that particular sense. Like Obviously, they can't kill you or torture you. I mean, it depends if you're like Cadbury. But um, unless you do dabble in child slavery. Um, I don't remember if it was actually Cadbury. But chocolate manufacturers have a history of... Um, Slavery. Uh, and when I say history, I don't mean 200 years ago. I mean, like, you know, 2022. So anyway, um, the idea that we actually need democracy in these things, because if businesses work purely democratic, then it wouldn't need to be for profit. You wouldn't need to work for profit because not everybody, because remember, democracy is majority rule. So if people decided, no, no, we want it to be sustainable, not profitable, then it could just continue indefinitely without needing to constantly expand, which is why production increases. And actually, a lot of the food that we produce just gets thrown away. So, fun. The fourth question that I've made into a statement um, is that we need to basically move towards democracy everywhere. That's kind of been... Anyway, number five, we need to redistribute power so that it isn't basically... Uh, set towards individualistic ends. So you don't want to uh, have it be about profits, etc., etc. Uh, so yeah. Uh, a couple other like questions that you ask later is, is things like the idea that conglomerates, which is like the, the new mode of life, correct? Is um, whatever. Uh, conglomerates make things uh, better or whatever. So a monopoly. They don't. Uh, monopolies actually make things worse. They decrease competition, which is the central uh, like principle of capitalism. So it literally, the idea of, a, of a, like a monopoly goes against capitalism. You don't even have to be a socialist to be against this. Um, so yeah, the idea of like, oh, it's convenient. It's convenient to get these like this food easily, whatever. But who's it actually the most convenient for? And she argues, no, it's more so convenient for these corporations. Because if the corporations are getting more money out of you, well, then... Cool. That's great. It's actually more convenient for them than it is for you to be able to just buy food anytime. So also this idea of is food a right or is it a privilege? Because technically, I believe, I don't know if it's changed, but um, food is not considered a human right according to the United Nations, which you might think is ridiculous. Like, okay, you have right to life, but you can't live without food like, I'm pretty sure they have right to water is a thing, but not right to food. And that's probably because food is a big business. Anyway. So. Um, the rest of it is, is much uh, shorter. She basically talks about things like the idea that, um, you know, uh, there's this myth that uh, animal, uh, that plant protein is, is somehow inferior to plant protein. That's nonsense. Protein is protein. But here's some nonsense myths. Now, the chapter is called Protein Myths and New Look. So this is myths about protein. Number one, meat contains more protein than any other food. Not true. They are plants that contain more. Eating lots of meat is the only way to get enough protein. Not true. Lots of, of plants are high protein plants. Uh, number three, meat is the sole, so, so, uh, the sole source of certain essential vitamins and minerals. Not true. You can get them in other places. Number four, meat is the highest quality protein. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. Five, plant protein is missing certain amino acids and so can never equal the quality of meat. No, wrong. Incorrect. Number six, plant-centered diets are dull. 
absolute rubbish. If you have ever actually spoken to like, gone to like a proper vegan dinner, oh my God, they cannot rely on meat because meat is lazy. All right. Meat is like lazy. You, you People just chuck a bunch of meat on the plate and they're like, there's your food. You can't do that if it's like completely plant-based. They have to figure out how to make things actually taste nice and to taste good because meat is lazy. It's lazy. It's so easy. So that's rubbish. Have a proper, have a proper vegan meal someday. It is amazing. Like the ones who know how to make it properly. Uh, also, of course, there have been entire cultures that have been very focused on veganism. Like various Buddhist cultures have been very focused on veganism. And you know what? Um, a lot of these like Buddhist countries are are Asian countries. And um, where does martial arts come from? So this idea that, oh, to be like a manly, manly, masculine man, you have to eat meat. I'm pretty sure a lot of these, you know, vegan monks could kick their asses. But anyway, that's also a, a, a bad way of seeing it. But the idea that, oh, you have to, only through meat consumption can you be a big, strong, manly man. Absolute rubbish. And if you do think that, then you're a poor man. Um, number seven. Plant foods contain a lot of carbs and are therefore more fattening than meat. Certain ones are. You have to find, you know, what the right ones. Because it is true that a lot of plants can be quite carb intensive, but not all of them. Uh, number eight, a meat centered diet provides a more nutritious uh, diet overall than uh, than those in underdeveloped. No, also nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Now, the rest of this is basically just saying the same kind of things, you know reiterating things but now book two so there's two books now i'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's very very short uh it's not actually short it's, it's like literally half the book <laughs> but it's great okay it is hilarious the second half of this book is straight up a cookbook like this is like an academic book essentially i mean not really it's a very, it's a very easy read but the second half is straight up just a cookbook it's so good and um she first of starts off in a chapter called but it takes too much time so obviously that's you know the idea of eating healthy food takes too long so no 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 there's four things yeah know what to have around the house so make sure you always have easy to make foods around the house for when you do just want to make something quickly number 2 take advantage of the idea of intentional leftovers Make food so that it lasts till the next day, even the day after that, so you can continue eating it. So you can make a lot of food now, and then it can be food for the next days. So, I mean, I've been doing this for like, well, not recently, but I used to do this where I would make my food on Sunday, and then it would be for the whole week. Now, that wouldn't be all of my food, obviously, but like a large amount of it. Number three, change where you shop. Uh, basically, try to find the right places to get food. Now, this can be a, a really difficult thing. Where I live at the moment... There's actually a really cool place that is quite cheap and sells um, basically food that's grown locally. That's really cool. Not everybody has that option. Um, this can be quite obviously like American centric where they have a lot more options. But if at all possible, try and change where you shop. The problem is a lot of the time, these other places where you shop can be um, expensive, <laughs> which isn't great. But anyway, and then try to lay out your kitchen in such, such a, in such a way that it's it's more time saving. Like know where things are so you can do things quite quickly. But straight up, she makes uh, tells how to make um, recipes for sauces, how to make oven based dishes, how to make uh, stove top dishes, how to make pies, how to make sandwiches, how to make soups, how to make salads, uh, and then all sorts of things like uh, Indian food, Middle Eastern food, Brazilian food, Greek food, Mexican food, uh, Italian food. Um, what it's called oriental food which I would say like Asian food uh, oriental is a bit of an old fashioned word uh, but then yeah things like snacks and appetizers and stuff like that breakfasts so yeah you, you don't and also of course dessert that you don't need to have meat uh, these are all for meatless diets now for her they, it was not actually these are not vegan dishes these are more over lacto vegetarian dishes so it'll have eggs and it'll have milk in it but you can now you don't have to read that cookbook obviously that's the second half of the book there's lots of vegan like foods and lots of vegan cookbooks that you can find that can help you if you want to eat uh, uh, basically more ethically because also what she says here is essentially if you want to eat in a way that is the most environmentally friendly, that that wastes the least, do not eat meat. It's 
pretty much the biggest thing that you can do. And this is something that would be reiterated by her daughter. And now this book was published in 2010. So like 40 years after after died for a uh, small planet. And this one, I love the title of this book. It's called Diet for a Hot Planet, The Climate Crisis at the End of Your Fork, and What You Can Do About It. I love the title. It's great. Now, a lot of the stuff, also there's a plane going overhead. I'm going to just talk over it. Let's just talk over the plane, 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 plane. So, this one, now this is 2010. Now, 1971, when, the, when her mother's book came out, climate change wasn't really a thing. I mean, it was happening, and I'm sure there were some climate scientists, but it really didn't become a big thing until much, much later. Um, so she didn't really discuss that. She was talking about more how wasteful it is. But her daughter was like, no, let's, let's actually look at how bad it is for the environment. So she starts off the book actually in a really great way because she f- starts off with the opposite of what the current things is because factory farms are like the main way to produce meat. And when it comes to even creating our agriculture, also absolutely devastating to the environment, as we know from Silent Springs, all those pesticides, herbicides, which are still being used. Now, she talks about a specific farm called the Full Belly Farm, and it's an environmentally friendly farm, and it does things like this, all right? We uh, do not want to use all of these things that can kill things, right? We don't want to, like, be, be killing all of this stuff. Uh, like plants and and pests. What do you do? Well, quite simple. Have animals. This farm has a full owl sanctuary and bat sanctuary. The owls go and kill all things like rodents and stuff. It's it's natural. They're just hunting. And the the bats go and kill things like insects and everything. And they have lots of these, and they just sort of spread out. It's great. Now, also things like like weeds. You don't need to to throw herb up. Uh, herbicides and stuff on them they can just be removed in other ways um, also it's of course about because one of the things that really really affects things is what's called single crop farming which i briefly mentioned before now that is not a natural way to do farming now as i remember as i said earlier natural doesn't mean bad uh, natural doesn't mean good necessarily but the the soil is a natural thing right we are not natural but the soil is not it is a very natural thing so you generally want to try and keep it that way in uh, as many ways as you can. You don't want to cause too many problems with it. So you don't want to do these single crop things, which basically single crop, you plant the same crop over and over and over and over again, and it kills the soil. Now, what you're supposed to be doing is revolving crops. And this is what they do at like this farm. They revolve crops. So each season, they'll be at like a new patch. Because what happens is plants actually do give off various minerals and all sorts of things. And an increase in diversity increases the soil, uh, basically, nutrition. So your soil stays better for longer. Now, she also, when it comes to animals, brings up some lovely stats. A third of all cereal, half of all corn, 90% of soy goes to feed animals. The animals we eat. Imagine that. A third of all cereal, half of corn, 90% of soy. Soy is used in everything. People who want to pretend that soy is like a bad thing. Have you ever eaten chips? Yes, you probably have. It's got soy in it. Soy is used everywhere. Supplements use soy. Uh, various foods use soy, uh, soy to supplement. Uh, lots of snacks have soy in them. Lots of just regular foods have soy in them. Soy is everywhere. So if you want to pretend otherwise, you're in denial. Now also... Two-thirds of agricultural land is used on animals. So already, they're taking a third of our, our cereal, half of our corn, 90% of our soy, and two-thirds of our agricultural land is being used on these animals. And also, a quarter of all fish is also fed to livestock. So, we are spending so much of our food to feed livestock. Now, the thing is, feeding livestock... I am an animal person, animal lover. I love animals. It's a big focus of what I study. However, the animal agribusiness industry is extremely cruel and unethical. So here we're just looking at the the actual wasteful aspect of it. But we are wasting that much to perpetuate 
a absolutely devastatingly unethical system. So we are wasting this much on torture, which you know, not great, not really. Now she also talks about things like, well, how did it get this bad? Simple, government subsidies and tax incentives to increase production. And also, of course, climate policy has always lagged behind because here's the thing, it's crazy, I know. Um, uh, policymakers, politicians, are not scientists. They do not realize the damage that they do. So they're like, no, it's fine. We, we want to make more work. We want to have more food, increase production. It's give them a, a subsidy. And of course, these, these companies also love to use various loopholes and they capitalize on these things and they use things like contract farming, which is really, really terrible because contract farming is... Okay, for a very, very simple uh, explanation of this, uh, or someone who's much better than me, you can look up the John Oliver episode about chickens. Now, it's not about the torture of chickens, so you don't need to worry. But essentially, what they do is... Right, I'm a huge, I'm a huge, huge wheat producer, let's say, for instance. I make bread. So, rather than having all my own farms, it's essentially like Uber... There's various farms that work for me. As soon as they underproduce, I can like kick them out. So all the risk is on them. Now it's, I, I don't own any machines. I don't own the land. I just get the produce. So if they don't make the produce, they get nothing, but they get stuck with all the expenses. Perfect. Which means vertical uh, power. There's people on top, but they have none of the liability. So it's absolute capitalism, which is wonderful. Um... So, cool. Now, why have we not noticed this? Simple. There's a bunch of reasons. Uh, it's food. We don't want to think about it. Especially meat. You don't want to think about what actually goes on. You don't want to know how you got that chicken. You just want to go, it's chicken. What's wrong with my chicken? I don't, I don't want to know what they did to the bird. I don't want to know about the electrocutions. So, um, you know, it's not great. Now, also, we've become very, very focused nowadays on carbon greenhouse gases. And we're not focused on the other things. We're not really focused on the things sinking into the groundwater. We're not really as focused on the things that are sinking into the soils. We're not really focused on those things. We're too busy looking at greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and not paying attention to pesticides. So we're paying attention to, to just one thing rather than a lot more. Uh, another thing that's, that's irritating is that the animal and what the, the farming industry is very complicated and we've also developed this mentality this was also seen a lot in the during the pandemic there was this whole well in south africa they said this lives versus livelihoods we need to save the economy and that's what they did here what a lot of these people argue it's the farmer or it's the planet it can't be both so that's become like a big thing. Are, are you going to let like poor farmers, you know, uh, die? Are you going to let poor, poor farmers, uh, you know, suffer just because what the plant is dying? As if that's a reason. That's the kind of thing that they do. And also another big thing is that food is often considered something very, very off limits. You don't want to talk about food. Food is something like special. And in a lot of cultures, food is something traditional and sacred. But that doesn't stop capitalists from capitalizing on it. And furthermore, this is how agribusiness, which is like the agricultural industry, how they get away with it. First off, they just don't answer. They just be quiet. They sow doubt. You know, that's a pun. They so Anyway, uh, they completely screw with statistics. So they give up. They'll give statistics that uh, a great example of this, actually, is uh, a, um, an advert I saw for a, a clothing and food chain in South Africa called Woolworths. And then this big sign, and it said, we care, or something like that. We care about the environment. By 20, you know, 24 or whatever the date was, we promise that 100% of our garments will have sustainable properties. Now, someone who doesn't know how to um, read critically will look at that and go, oh, wow, 100% will have sustainable property. That's great. 100% sustainability. That's, that's amazing. But there's actually a special word in there. Properties. Sustainable properties. Not the whole thing. 
It could just be that the water used in, in clothing production, which also, by the way, water is a huge thing in clothing production. They could just be like, oh, the water is going to be the sustainable thing and nothing else is. That's still a sustainable property of making clothes. So anyway, another thing that they do is that they question the science. Oh, well, yeah, the, the science isn't out yet. This is how the tobacco industry got away with it for years. They were like, well, there's no proof that it does definitely cause cancer. So if it doesn't definitely cause cancer, then you can't make statements like it does cause cancer. They do that kind of thing. They're great. Um, also, of course, these this industry has been tied up with other industries. Things like the pharmaceutical industry is tied up with it because all the animals that we eat are pumped full of, of antibiotics so that they can survive the grueling conditions we put them through so that they can survive the infections that happen because of their poor conditions. I won't go into it. I could, but I won't because a lot of people don't want to hear that kind of stuff, which is also actually part of the problem. If you don't want to hear about the way that animals are treated, then you shouldn't be eating meat. No one should be eating meat. But if you can't handle the, the knowledge of what we do to them, then you shouldn't be eating them because you can't even handle... Uh, you, know, you can't handle the truth. So, fun. Chemicals, that industry is also still booming. It's tied up in that. And then also, of course, there's the feed industry. So that's like all that other stuff that we produce for animals to eat, and not us, and the oil industry. If we tell the farm industry not to do the things they're doing, we are then screwing over the pharmaceutical companies, the, the chemical companies, the feed companies, and the oil industry. And they will not let that happen. So... None of us is on our side. So it's quite simple. How do these companies get away with it? Now, this is called what, what uh, she calls playing with our food. It's chapter four. This is the, the playbook. This is how they get away with it. Number one, they embrace the idea of being environmentally friendly. Like that Woolworths ad I spoke about. That I know we, we're going to be eco-friendly. So what do you do? You advertise that. You go, look, look, this is the new us. We are a sustainable company. Then you spin the story. You spin it your own way. Then you deploy front groups. So groups that will agree with you. Then you exaggerate your chance. Look at how great, look, 100% sustainable properties. 100% sustainable properties. Exaggerating your transformation. Be your own police. Number Number six. This is the next one. This is a great one. You are the one that's governing it. There's no, there's no government agency that's looking out to make sure that you're, you're doing what you say you're going to do. This is actually a thing that a lot of these companies do. Every like 10 years, they'll say something like, oh, we will be, um, we will be a carbon neutral by 2025. And then in 2020, they go, we will be carbon neutral by 2030. And people can't remember five years ago. So they just accept it every single time. And the last step is rewarding yourself, being like, look at all this amazing stuff we've done, such as having a lovely advertisement saying, we're going to have sustainable products. You should buy from us. So that's fun. Now, she does basically have the, the, the second last section, which is about hope. How can we do this? Because we can. We can, we can, we can move towards uh, what's called cool food. So we can follow the way that nature does things, so diversity, everything like that. We can introduce restorative aspects to farming. We can use animals to help with this regenerative aspect, you know, so like the bats and stuff that I spoke about earlier. We can build resilient crops. So rather than doing these like single crops that have to go, go, go all the time, we make crops that can withstand things. And then we can also promote it in our community. So it becomes a community thing, not a capitalistic, individualistic thing, but rather something for everyone. Cool. Now, there are a couple of myths. Like her mother, she also has a section near the end where she's debunking myths. The inevitability myth that industrial farming is the only way to do it. No, it isn't because sustainable farms exist. They just don't get the funding. They don't get the, the, the hype. Second myth, the trade-off or false trade-off myth that the idea that, I don't know, we, well, you have to choose between sustainable farms and essential forests. No, you don't. You don't have to do that. Number three, the poverty myth. Oh, it'll lead to poverty. No, it will not. If this becomes embraced as a business structure, it will get more people who do it. And so it will not be, uh, you know, it will not lead to poverty. This is also the fourth myth, 
the prosperity first myth that we must first go towards, you know, prosperity. Making money is more important than the environment. That's rubbish because the people who are making the money are going to die before the environment dies. Uh, the dog outside is barking again. There's the hunger myth. Oh, it won't feed everyone. You know what? Her mother's book disproved that. There's the technology book, uh, the technology myth, that technology, we need technology to save us. No, we don't. We, we can actually use old school techniques and it'll also work because what happens when we use this kind of tech? What, what happens? You get the idea of super pests. I already briefly mentioned this, right? The insects and stuff that have adapted to the chemicals we spray on them. We get more invasive species. We get loss of biodiversity. These are the kind of things that damage us. So fun. Also, I won't read the actual things that I wrote in my own notes because I swear a lot in my own notes. These are for me. These notes are for me, not for other people. Um, and I'd rather have this not be a swearing thing just for, you know, the sake of it. And then, of course, she has her last section, which is called uh, Action. And some of the things that you can do to, to just improve yourself. So try and use real and whole foods if you can. Try to embrace vegetarianism. And if you must go for meat, you should try and find properly fed and whatever. But of course, not everybody can get this. This is like a, a major thing. Not everyone can get this. But she was writing to an American audience. Um, like, I'm not American. I'm from South Africa. <laughs> like, I can't do all this stuff. Getting organic food. Um, getting like embracing vegetarianism when like vegetarian food often costs more than than cheap meat which is terrible um uh, anyway embrace organic foods where as often as pros as, as possible she also actually has a special section in it that discusses what organic actually means and what is organic and what isn't organic because the word organic is thrown around a lot so you actually have to do a lot more you have to put a lot more of yourself into your food if you want to actually do something. Um, and then another thing, this is a really big thing. Eat all of your food. Humans waste so much food. We throw out so much food. And I'm guilty of this too. I forget that food is in the fridge and then it goes off and I have to throw it away. Literally last week, I had to throw away a whole thing of broccoli. So awesome. Um, Preferably try and go local if you can. Like I said, we have that local place near us, but they don't sell everything. But that's like fruit and veg and it's really, really great. If you have something like that near you, try and do that. And a lot of the time, actually, these local places can often be cheaper than the than the, the grocery stores, which is kind of weird. But anyway, not always. Sometimes they overprice. Yeah, but this place we went to, not at all. I bought like a box of, of melons, a box of melons, and... That costs the equivalent of, if I went to the shop, that's the equivalent of like two melons. I got nine. Also, to to completely one-up myself and show how terrible I am, that I'm not great, is that about three of them went off because it couldn't fit in my fridge. So I couldn't keep them all fine. And uh, I eventually started smelling something. I was like, what's that smell? I take the box off the cupboard. And um, thankfully, I was shirtless at the time because a bunch of um, <clears throat> fruit juice landed on me from the box because three of them had gone off. And that was a great experience. Anyway, it was also literally right after I showered. So I was like, awesome. Now I'm going to go and clean myself again. Anyway, the next one she, she says, this one's actually really difficult. Try to move away from plastic packaging. I do not know a single place that, that does no plastic. They, I know there are places like that in America and they're expensive. I do not know a single place that is no plastic. That that, But if you can find those places, that's a miracle. And you should go there because try to reduce your plastic consumption if at all possible. And the last one actually is make the food yourself. Don't go to restaurants and stuff. Because actually restaurants are extremely wasteful. They throw away a lot. Especially because like, for instance, they, they have to use the most pristine things. If you're getting, if you're going to get like a, a, a tomato from a restaurant, they're going to cut off and throw away the ends because the ends aren't sexy, attractive pieces of tomato. They're going to basically use the middle only. That's wasteful. They, they throw away so much that could feed so many people. But now one of the big things, this was actually recently um, 
which is betraying myself a bit um, because I'm recording this quite ahead, actually. I saw a thing at the time of recording, it'll be quite a while back, where there was some kind of an article that said that consumers have a plastic addiction. No, they don't. We don't buy plastic because we have to. Oh, because we want to. We buy it because we have to. I don't know where to buy fruit and, and stuff that doesn't have plastic packaging. That place that, that I mentioned that's nearby, a whole bunch of it is no plastic. Like those melons. It's in a box. A cardboard box. No plastic. But if I wanted to buy strawberries, if I wanted to buy apples, if I want to buy anything else, it is plastic. It's wrapped in plastic. So there's plastic everywhere. Uh, and you, you shouldn't pretend otherwise. You shouldn't pretend that people are just like, oh, lazy and they want to have plastic. No one wants plastic. Like We all know that plastic's bad. No one wants it. But you have to have it because there's no other options. But anyway, um, I had pictured these being like 20, 30 minute things. And this is now currently clocking in at like 50 minutes. Um... Whoops, I guess I can talk about three books for quite a while. I was planning on mostly making these about like single books and stuff or like single authors, but these three thematically tied together. So I felt I should, but I suppose if the first one's quite a long one, that's all chill. So uh, I think we're going to end it here. Uh, if you are interested in looking at, I mean, this, this channel that you would have watched this on, LC Lupus, uh, there's a bunch of things that are like more edited and like made, and it's not just a rant like this. Um, talking about books, it's talking about actual like specific things, usually media products. So you can go and look at that if you want. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. I have a a um, a podcast as well, which I do with my my good friend uh, Tristan. He's he's a fun guy, and we chat about we talk shit about games and the games industry. Oh, I swore. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to swear in this. Oh, now I have to find that and bleep it out because I don't want this to have swearing in it. Anyway, uh, yeah, we just talk nonsense about games, you know. Um, and then we also actually do a an interview series where we interview South African uh, game devs and people in the sort of the industry and in media and whatever. So that's quite cool. That's quite fun. Um, so yeah, check us out. Uh, that's uh, it's it's attached to this channel, but it will be the two cent report if you if you want to find it elsewhere. Um, so yeah, that is pretty much that I believe, and I hope that you have a fantastic day further. And I would really recommend reading these books; they're actually quite great. So yeah, and uh, bye bye. I hope that you have a great day. Bye.